Lord Jesus, everything that is good comes from you. And so even now, Lord, we look to you. We look to your hand. We, we want to look to your face, Lord. Speak to us, we pray. Help us to be ready to receive what you have for us, to be a good soil that receives the good seed of your word that will produce life in us. Amen. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Glorify your name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So I spoke last week about the Lord Jesus dwelling in us and transforming us into his image and that we should examine ourselves to see whether we are getting closer to that goal. You know, a year has passed. Where are we now? You know, having gone through that year, are we making progress towards our goal? And we looked at uh, the fact that... Um, you know, we should examine ourselves to see whether the Lord Jesus is being made more real within us, that his character and his life is being, becoming more and more apparent in our lives day to day. Um, and along the same theme, I'd like to, uh, you know, this time challenge us to look at um, ourselves as a church, to see whether we as a church are making progress. And I think the Lord has prepared the way for us this morning in everything that has been spoken already. And to see whether we are making progress. And I would say the, the most important characteristic about a church is that we love one another. When Jesus began to build his church, he said this, you know, he was beginning to do a new thing. And with, when, it, when he's desiring to build something new, he says, I give you a new commandment in keeping with what I am uh, wanting to accomplish. And so he says to the disciples, a new commandment I give to you. What is that commandment? That you love one another. And he said the primary identifying characteristic about his church is that his disciples love one another. There were many teachers in Jesus' time and many disciples following after those many different teachers. We, knew, we know that the Pharisees were teachers who had a following, had disciples, and who were learning from them. But Jesus said, people, all men, will know that you are my disciples, not someone else's. Uh, and he said, clearly, this will distinguish you from all the other disciples and teachers out there. Uh, this one fact that you have love for one another. So this is the, what I see the primary mark or the primary distinguishing characteristic about the church that Jesus is building. We can see many churches out there, many local bodies uh, of, of uh, believers, local fellowships. Um, but, you know, we want to look to ourselves and see what distinguishes us from not necessarily the other churches, but everyone else in this world. You know, everyone is following somebody. I'm not just talking about following on Facebook, but even that is true. When you follow somebody, you want to learn from them and you are influenced by them, by their life, by their teaching, their philosophy, whatever it is. But we all follow someone or something. And Jesus says, what distinguishes the ones who follow me is that you have love for one another. And that should be real for us. And we see, you know, we, we spoke about, you know, in individual terms last week. And I just want to uh, read this verse from 1 John verse 16. In the individual sense, uh, the Lord tells us, the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. So as an individual, the one who abides in love abides in God because God is love. And therefore, as a result, he promises God abides in him. So if I abide in love because God is love, then God abides in me. But corporately as a church, we also have a similar promise. 1 John 4 verse 12, it says there, if we love one another, God abides in us. That's a promise. If we love one another, God abides in us. 
This is the primary characteristic of that, that should be evident in a church that distinguishes us as a church of Jesus, that we love one another. And if that is true, then he abides in us. So let me ask you and challenge you. Do you want the Lord Jesus to abide in us? Do we as a church want the Lord Jesus to abide in us? Do we want him to be present here in our midst and in a real way? Do we seek revival? Yes, we do. But this one uh, condition should be met. That we love one another. And if we do, then he promises he will abide in us. He will come and dwell among us. Just as Jesus said in, um, in the Gospel of John um, and chapter 14, that if you love me, you will keep my commandments and my Father will love you and we together will come and we will make our abode with you. Love is the condition. Do we love God? Do we obey His commandments? Then we prepare the way for Him to come and dwell among us. Uh, among us. If that is not there, there is no promise. If that is not there, there is no promise for that. But the promise is, if we love one another, God abides in us. And, you know, uh, God is the source. We are told in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, God is love. So love comes from Him. It originates in Him. He made us. He gave us, you know, He made us in His image. He gave us a capacity to love and experience love. But the source is God. And everything that God does is infused with love. Because God is love. And if He is love, then everything that He does it is, is infused with love. This characteristic that He says about Himself. And therefore... We are told in 1 John 4, verse 19, we love because He first loved us. Amen. We love because He first loved us. It is a result of Him loving us. And He has poured out His love into our hearts. Romans 5, verse 5 tells us clearly, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen? As a new believer, that is, that is his promise. He pours out his love into your heart through the Holy Spirit. And um, now that the Lord's love has been poured into our hearts, it's our turn now also to pour it out to others. And if we look at, you know, uh, an illustration, when you make a cup of tea, you... Put some water in a kettle, you boil that water in the kettle, and then what do you do? You pour that hot water into a cup to make a cup of tea. And then what happens? Then somebody has to drink that water, that, that, that tea from that cup. That's, that's like God pouring His love, the kettle pouring into the, the cup. That's like God pouring into us. The next step is someone has to drink it. It's a pouring out from the cup to bless someone else. But you know what happens if no one drinks it? It just stays there. What happens eventually? It goes cold. And then nobody wants it anymore. It gets thrown out. So I, I think we are like that. It, I think it's a good picture for us to remember. God pours into us. And then our duty is to pour it into, onto others. And if nobody uh, gets to taste from that cup, the love of God, what's going to happen? It's going to go cold. And nobody's going to want it. And you know, we are told, um, I think it's in the, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says this about the last days. The love of many will grow cold. Who is he talking about? Those who had love. Those who received love to begin with. But the love of many will grow cold. Brother will betray brother, father his son, and so on and so forth. Because the love of many will grow cold. So, then there is a danger for us. But how do we keep the love of God flowing in us and through us? You've got to pour it out. And once that cup of tea is, is, is empty, what happens? More water gets poured in. 
And I read this also online about, you know, growing vegetables. Uh, I think it's another good ex uh, illustration for us. When you grow vegetables in your veggie garden, um, it is known that uh, frequent harvesting of those vegetables produces better tasting vegetables and also encourages a higher yield. So the more you harvest those vegetables, the better quality they produce and the more quantity they produce also. And so I think the love of God is like that in us as well. God pours his love into us, but you've got to harvest that. What happens when you harvest it? Someone else benefits of it. And the frequent harvesting of that increases your, the quantity of your love and the quality of your love also. And the, so, you know, there's no reason for us to sit around and pray endlessly, God, fill me with your love that I can love others. God has already done it. What am I doing about it, though? Even if it is a small measure, my cup is small. What am I to do? Use that. Start with that. Pour that out. Love others. Harvest that love. And what happens? Your measure, and your quantity and your quality will grow as you use it. I think that is true about God's love for us. The more and more we experience God's love for us and meditate on His love, God is pouring into our lives. But then He expects us to use that. Pour it onto others. That's exactly what Jesus did. He came and poured out the love of God onto us. And now it is our turn also to pour it out. And you know the natural outflow of God pouring into us is that we love God and we love others. You know the commandments, the first and foremost, and the second commandments in the Bible? The first is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. These are the two most important commandments. Everything else uh, falls under these two. And so the natural outflow of God pouring his heart into my life is that I love him and I love others. Love my neighbor as myself. But first of all, you know, the first expression of it is to love the brethren. And in um, First John again, you know, there's so much about love in the, the letter of John, the first letter of John. And he says this, If someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that one who loves God should love his brother also. And again in 1 John 5, verse 1, whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. So we can't separate the two. Loving God and loving the brethren. Loving those who are born of God. Um, and as I said, God is love and everything that he does is infused with love. Therefore, as a result, we too, being his church, Everything that we do should be infused with love. Do you agree with me? Amen. Jesus clearly tells us, love one another. This is going to make you stand out as being my disciples. Why? Because you, you know, God is pouring his love into you. And therefore, you ought to love one another. In the same way that Jesus has loved us, we ought to love one another. And so, as his church who receive of his love every day, who receive of his goodness and the riches of Christ every day. That should be real for us uh, when, you know, we, we are out there in the world, that others can taste of the love of God through us, but also within the church, um, that we love one another, that we express this love of God amongst ourselves, and when that is true, God is among us. And I believe that our love for God is the foundation upon which we can rightly love others also. It is the love of God towards us, but also our love for God. That is a foundation uh, upon which we can love others rightly also. also. 
And only when we love the Lord supremely, then we can uh, love others in the right way. And the more we love God, the more we can love others. Meditate on that uh, to see if it's true. The more we love God, the more we can love others. And the less we love God, the less we will love others. And if you don't love God and don't keep His commandments, you know what the result is? You know what you are left with? A selfish, self-centered kind of love. It is possible to love, even if you are not a Christian, not a born-again believer, but you know what that love is? It's selfish. It's self-centered. Jesus said to, to the disciples, if you love only those who love you, what more are you doing than them? So it is possible, but that love is, is not going to be uh, the real thing. It is going to be a self-centered kind of love. And you know what a person looks like when they are dominated by this self-love? I see a good picture of it in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 2 to 4. You know what we see there? These characteristics of such a person, person which can also be attributed to a backslidden Christian. Lovers of self, lovers of money, unloving towards others, and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Such, you know, vivid characteristics, I think. Uh, lovers of money, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, and unloving towards others. We see those characteristics mentioned there. And you know, I think it's also true that when we love God supremely, we have a right perspective for all our other loves. The way we love ourselves, the way we love our family, the way we love others, the way we love the brethren, and the way we even love our enemies. When we love God supremely, all of these other loves fall into their, the right perspective Amen. and the right place. Because Jesus said, if anyone loves mother, father, son or daughter, or anyone more than me, you are not worthy of me. But those things fall into the right place. God, Jesus is not saying, don't love your family. Don't love your brother and sister. Don't love your mother and father. Quite the opposite. He says, honor your father and mother. And it was the Pharisees who were cancelling out the commandments of God, which were about honoring my father and mother and providing for them and helping them. But Jesus says, I must be in that supreme place, in that, uh, you know, in that uh, first, first place, first position. And once I am there, then you can love others rightly in the right perspective, the right place. And if I am loving God supremely, all the other things will fall into the right place. Money, material things, pleasure. God doesn't say throw all these things away, they're no good. He says keep them in the right place. Amen. Don't love money. Use it. We all need to use it and handle it. But it comes, in, you know, it comes to its right place and right position in our lives when we love God supremely. And also pleasure. God gave us the, you know, the privilege of experiencing pleasure. He doesn't say throw all, the, all pleasures away. No, He built that inside of us, within us. But He says keep it in the right place. Don't be a lover of pleasure rather than a lover of God. Rather be a lover of God and pleasure will fall in, into its right place. He allows us to enjoy pleasure and good things, but they are not to be the primary thing for us. Let us not be characterized by the same characteristics we see there in 2 Timothy chapter 3 of the difficult times that will come in the last days. People who love themselves, who love money and love pleasure more than they love God. And the result is they are unloving towards all others. So, how should we love others then? What does it look like? Well, we need two, uh, some examples to follow. And I see two examples in the, the New Testament that we can follow. First of all, it's Jesus. 
And Jesus said to his disciples, As I have loved you, so you should love one another. So here's our example. But there is a second example also. That commandment of loving your neighbour. How should we love our neighbour? As you love yourself. So that's a, another good example for us. How I love myself. That's how I should love others. So let's look at the first one. As Jesus loved us. And as I mentioned already, he says, I, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And he says also, again, you know, he, he says this more than once in the Gospel of John. And John only records this. Um, and he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. How should I love as Jesus loved? Well, we can learn a few things from the way Jesus has loved us. He loved us before we loved him. And that's the first thing we can learn from the way Jesus has loved us. Initiative. It was his initiative. He loved us first. And if we are to learn from his example, what are we to do? We love others first. We take the initiative. And we don't wait for others to love us in order that we might love them. We ought to love them first before they love us. So that's the first thing I can learn from Jesus' example. And he didn't love us because we deserve it and we didn't earn it in any way. And so the second thing... And because he said, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. The second thing I can learn from Jesus is this, sacrifice. A love that is sacrificial. And it says that he gave himself up and he laid down his life. And this is the greatest love. This is uh, the greatest love that anyone can, can ever have and demonstrate towards another and so we can see that Jesus, in this sacrificial love towards us, he came to earth and he humbled himself. He became poor. He suffered inconvenience. He patiently endured man's wickedness and rejection and ungratefulness. He suffered hand, uh, pain at the hands of those whom he loved and he died a horrible death. This is the way in which he has demonstrated his love towards us. Can we learn from that? Have we got a lot to learn from that? I do. So Jesus says, as I have loved you, love one another in the same way. And then secondly, as we love ourselves, and we should love others in the same practical way that we love ourselves. It seems a bit, um, you know, uh, wrong to say it, but we all love ourselves, don't we? And God doesn't say that we are to hate ourselves. He says that we are not to love our life, otherwise, otherwise we lose it. But it's a given that we love ourselves. And we take good care of ourselves. So in the same practical way that we look after ourselves and love ourselves, uh, that's, in, that's the same way in which, the same practical way in which we should love others also. And so, you know, we see this um, in, the, in the scriptures. We are told to, we are commanded to love God. We are commanded to love our neighbor. We are commanded to love our enemies and we are commanded to love the brethren. But you know, we are never commanded to love ourselves. The Word of God says that we already love ourselves. And it's a natural thing. And if you're a healthy human being, you know, mentally, um, you naturally love yourself. You take care of yourself, don't you? Nobody harms themselves. Nobody starves themselves to death. Nobody purposely wants to make themselves 
look horrible or maim themselves or, or do anything like that. What do we do? We spend time in the mirror. We spend time, you know, thinking about our diet. We look after ourselves, make sure we get enough sleep. We do all the right things. Why? Because we take care of ourselves. It's natural. And so, you know, even in Ephesians uh, chapter 5, verses 28, 29, it talks there about husbands and wives. But it says there to the husband, the husband ought to also, ought also to love their own wives, how? As their own bodies. Because we know husbands love their own bodies. And it's true for every human being. So Jesus, you know, the Lord says to us, love your wife in the same way you love and care for your own body. Because he says, um, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. And he who loves his own wife loves himself. And we see this, you know, which some have called the, the golden rule, I think, in Matthew 7 verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat others as you would have them treat you. You know, Jesus is so practical. That's such a practical way, you know, to explain something like that. Treat others in the same way you want them to treat you. And I say that to my children. Why did you hit your sister? Do you want her to hit you? No. The answer is always no. Well, then do the same. It's so simple that anyone can understand it, even my three and five-year-olds. And Jesus tells us in the same way, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. Simple. Treat others as you treat your own body and treat others as you want them to treat you. And it's so practical, isn't it? It's so practical. We don't just wish that we would treat ourselves well. We don't just talk about treating ourselves well. We practically treat ourselves well. It's very practical. And so, let me challenge you. Do you want others to treat you with respect? I'm talking about in the church. This applies outside also, but our focus is primarily in the church. Do you want others to treat you with respect? What should you do? Do you want others to treat you with dignity? What should you do? Do you want others to treat you with honour? What should you do? Do you want others to treat you with kindness and gentleness? Well, the answer is simple. Do you want others to be patient with you? Then do the same. Do you want others to be, you know, treat you with compassion? Then do the same to them. If you want to be treated this way, treat others the same way. And as I said earlier, we are to learn from Jesus and take the initiative and love others in that way first. Boy, what a church we would be if we all took that initiative seriously. If anyone has a complaint against anyone, why do we have complaints against one another? Why do we have frictions? Why is there you know, frustrations uh, among us? Well, we're not taking the initiative. Most of the time, I think. Um, and, you, you know, the, the Lord says this also in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Let us not love with word or tongue, but in deed and truth. And Romans 12, verse 9 says, let love be without hypocrisy. And so I say, love is practical. Love is practical. It's not just in words. And I challenge you, look through the scriptures and see how many times God himself has told us in words, I love you. You'll scarcely find maybe one in the Old Testament, maybe in the Psalms or somewhere. You won't find Jesus saying, I love you. But what will you find? He will practically demonstrate it. And he has practically demonstrated it, hasn't he? And so our love for others is not so much in words. Words are good, but if there is no action, no practical uh, you know, follow, follow through, then our words are meaningless. That's what, that, that's what the Lord is telling us. Let us not love in word only, but in deed and truth. In reality, 
in practical ways. And let it be without hypocrisy. Romans 13 and, chapter, and verse 10 tells us, love does no wrong to a neighbor. And so I think we need to get rid of the things that are contrary to loving one another as well. We practice the right things, the things we expect others to do to us. We practice those, but also get rid of the things which are contrary to loving one another. Uh, and are, uh, uh, you know, causing our love for one another to grow cold. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 20, we see there some examples. And, you know, this was true in the, in the Corinthian church. Well, Paul was saying, I may, I'm afraid that I might come to you and find these things among you. And what, what are those things that he talks about? He says, I might find strife, I might find jealousy, I might find angry tempers, I might find disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, disturbances. Not that Paul wanted to find these things, but he was afraid that he might come to, the church, to that church and find these things in their midst. Should these things be present in the church? No, they shouldn't be. And what do they do? They are contrary to loving one another as Christ has loved us. So these things should disappear from our midst. We should identify them, see them for what they are. You know, jealousy, <coughs> angry tempers, slanders, gossip, arrogance towards one another, looking down on others. All of these things should <coughs> disappear from our midst. And you know, we talk about, we, we have spoken about in the past about um, the New Testament tells us um, or teaches us about all of these one anotherings in the New Covenant. And, you know, maybe I can read through the list for you this morning as well. Uh, all of these one anotherings. Be at peace with one another. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Be of same, the same mind towards one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. And regarding weaknesses, it tells us, accept one another just as Christ also accepted us. Admonish one another, and it, as members of one body, care for one another. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, show tolerance for one another. And lay aside falsehood, speak truth each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Bear with one another and forgive each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Teach and admonish one another. Live in peace with one another. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another. Encourage one another. Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Fervently love one another from the heart. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. Each, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as stewards of the manifold grace of God. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. And in the letter of 1 John, five times it says, love one another. So many one anotherings. It's a long list. But this is, is what a, a new covenant church should look like. All of this one anothering. And, you know, I don't want to speak too much more. But in, in conclusion, I want to tell you that it's not just those who are in front who are responsible for the way the church is going. 
Each one of us are responsible to play our part uh, in the creating the right atmosphere in the church. Having the atmosphere of heaven where God is and in His presence there is love and fullness of joy. Do we want that sort of atmosphere here? We all are responsible for creating that. Don't just look at the leaders. We make mistakes too. We slip up. We fall. We are imperfect. But collectively, that is, you know, we, we are to love one another, bear with one another, encourage one another, correct one another. We should do all, the, all of these things. And what is the purpose? We want the Lord to be present here in our midst. Amen. That is the promise that He has for us. But where is the loving one another? It needs to be there, present. It's a condition. If we want the Lord to abide in us, we ought to love one another. If that love is missing and we are quarreling and fighting and there is disunity, the Lord does not promise to be there abiding in us. And so we are responsible. Let us be mature. Let us be responsible people. Let us be responsible brothers and sisters who care for one another and who want to have this church where Christ is present. And if He is present, all is well. So in conclusion, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew 24 and verse 12, Jesus says that because, of law, because lawlessness is increased in the last days, most people's love will grow cold. Don't be that person. Don't be that person. Let us be those whose love grows hotter and hotter, first for the Lord and also for one another. And if that is true, we can go out into the world and love others also. And as God is pouring His love into my life, I have to pour it out onto others. First in the body of Christ, in the church, and also outside. And this is the primary characteristic that distinguishes us as being the church of Jesus Christ. And that He is in our midst. We have the love of God in our hearts. But don't let the love of God grow cold in you. Pass it on and he'll pour more into you. Amen.